Okay, in this video, I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on magnetostatics. This is video number two, and I'm going to discuss the continuity equation. The previous video to this, which is relevant, is number one, where I discuss the Lorentz force law. So, first of all, just to remind us, we know that all magnetic phenomena are a result of the movement of electric charge. That means that there are no magnetic charges or what we call magnetic monopoles. In this particular video, I'm going to discuss current density. And we'll see that there are two types of current density in general. There is surface current density and volume current density. And from that, I'll move on to the continuity equation, which is one of the results of Maxwell's equations. So I'm going to first define the current per unit length. And you might not understand it immediately, but in a moment I will be able to look at it in a different way and perhaps that might be of uh, use to you. So just bear with me for a moment. We say that the current per unit length is given by the placeholder capital K. Now, we also say that it is equal to the surface charge density multiplied by the velocity of the charge. Now we know, of course, that if we integrate the surface charge density dA, we get the total charge. So the first formula for the the surface charge density is equal to the sur excuse me the surface current density is equal to the surface charge density multiplied by the velocity of the charge. Now another way of looking at this is is saying that capital K is the surface current density and that it is it is the uh, current per unit width perpendicular to the flow. The important point to note here is that it is perpendicular to the flow and I will show you a diagram later on which should illustrate this better. So for the moment, I think the best way to think about capital K is that it, it is the surface current density, rather than think of it, thinking of it as the current per unit width perpendicular to the flow. So if you think surface current density, you know that it comes from the surface charge density multiplied by the velocity of the charge. Now let's try and calculate the magnetic force or the Lorentz force as a result of this surface current density. So we know that the Lorentz force for, uh, for magnetism is written on the top right of your screen and it's the surface integral of V cross BDQ. So the first thing I'm going to do is sub in for DQ because we know that the total charge capital Q is the integral of sigma dA. So I'm going to plug in sigma dA because we're integrating over the surface. So this is the magnetic force due to surface current. And we can see pretty clearly that in fact we're talking about sigma multiplied by V, which of course is the surface current density. So we can rewrite the magnetic force due to surface current as the surface integral of the surface current density crossed with the magnetic field, K cross B. So in this case, if you can imagine that we have a current flowing this way along our, of our cylinder, the flow is going that way. So we take the, the uh, unit width perpendicular to the flow. So you can see here I've defined the unit width perpendicular to the flow. Now there's one way of looking at it. I prefer to think of it as the uh, the surface charge density multiplied by the velocity. Of course they're all, they're all uh, it's the same thing really. Now just to move on, we know that current itself is the flow of charge and we know really what we're talking about is the flow of electrons. This gives us the unit of coulombs per second as the unit of the current. Now another way of thinking of current is that it is the line charge density lambda multiplied by the speed of the charge. So this should make perfect sense to you having seen the definition for the surface current density k is equal to sigma v. So remember we used the surface charge density here in order to define this. So we have done something similar here to finding the current as the line charge density multiplied by the speed of the charge or the velocity of the charge. Note the units, we have uh, line charge density of coulombs per meter and speed of the charge meters per second, giving us of course coulombs per second. So once again I'm going to try and calculate the Lorentz force associated with this particular, uh, this particular quantity. So we want to calculate the magnetic force of a line segment of charge, or basically a, a wire, I suppose, really. So we integrate V cross B dQ. But we know that dQ is the, uh, the line charge density multiplied by the infinitesimal length along the wire. And that itself can be written 
in the following way. So we have the force due to a, a, line, a magnetic force due to a line segment as the line integral of v cross b times lambda dl. Or we can write this in terms of the current. And in this way, we can write the following equation. We have I cross B integrated DL. So this is the magnetic force on a line segment. Now, it's important to note the following. Let's say we have a wire. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to draw a straight wire, a reasonably straight wire, in fact. So this is, this is our wire. But at any point, we want to take, let's say this is the current here. The current is a vector. So as long as we take the, a small enough um, segment, we're always going to get a straight line. But if you think about it, as we integrate, we are also going to be integrating along a straight line segment. So really what we're going to see is that the, excuse me, the current is always going to be perpendicular or parallel, excuse me, to the infinitesimal uh, length segment. So for that reason, we can exchange the current and the infinitesimal length in the integral. And what we get is this final equation here. And this is the magnetic force on a line segment. So we have the current I outside of the line integral of dl cross b. So just compare this a moment with the, uh, the same or the, the similar integral we got a moment ago for the magnetic force due to a surface current. There we integrated the surface current density crossed with the magnetic field uh, across the surface. Here we integrate the line integral of the current outside of dl cross b, the infinitesimal line, uh, line element crossed with the magnetic field. So I'm sure you can see what's going to come next. We've done two of the three scenarios I'm going to look at, and I'm sure you can guess the next one we're going to look at is volume charge density. So we give capital J the placeholder for volume, excuse me, volume current density. Uh, I must say it again. Capital J is the placeholder for volume current density. Another way of thinking of that is the current per unit area perpendicular to the flow. Now, if you just go to the bottom left of your screen, I have a, an illustration which might help us here. So let's say we have cylindrical flow, J, and it's flowing in this particular direction here. So the current is flowing in that direction, or the, well, if, if the current density is flowing that way, and so is the current as a result. But we want to look at the density perpendicular to the flow. So for the volume current density, we look at the, the perpendicular area to the flow. When we looked at surface current density, we looked at the perpendicular length to the flow here. So I suppose in one, you can think of it as working one dimension, uh, one dimension less. But I think the easier way to think about this is as, as the volume current density. So you could probably suggest the following uh, equation, even just by thinking about it that the, uh, the volume current density is the volume charge density multiplied by the velocity of the charge. Now we know, of course, from our study of electrostatics that the total charge, capital Q, is the integral of the volume charge density d tau, where d tau is your infinitesimal volume, volume element. So putting that all together, we find that the volume current density is equal to di dA perpendicular. So once again, we're going to try and calculate the magnetic force on, uh, on a body due to the volume current density. So we start off with the Lorentz force on the top right of your screen. So you have the volume integral of V cross B dQ, and we sub in once again for dQ, which is, of course, rho d tau. Simply, if then we can sub in for the volume current density, capital J, and we get that the magnetic force, magnetic force, excuse me, due to volume current density is the volume integral of the current density crossed with the magnetic field integrated over the volume. Of course, we must remember that magnetism is caused by moving electric charge, not by stationary charges, and we do not have any ma magnetic monopoles or magnetic charges themselves. So I haven't once spoken about the continuity equation, but that is coming next. Nonetheless, though, the understanding or an understanding of the volume current density, the surface current density, and the line current density is very important in our understanding of the continuity equation. So just a little aside in regard to units. We know the current is the charge multiplied by the velocity, and that's written on the top left of your screen. Of course, looking at all the units, we get the units on charge, or excuse me, the units on current is coulombs per second. 
So let's just check the units. If we look at the current, we have the line charge density multiplied by the velocity of the charge. So that gives us coulombs per meter multiplied by meters per second, giving us coulombs per second. So this equation for the line charge density multiplied by the velocity is correct. So our line current formula is correct. What about our surface current? Well, our surface current is di dl perpendicular, or another way of looking at it is the is sigma times the velocity, where sigma is the surface charge density. So the product there in terms of units is going to be coulombs per meter squared multiplied by meters per second, giving us coulombs per second per meter, which is exactly what we'd expect. And finally, for volume current, we know that the volume current is equal to di dA perpendicular, or another way of writing it is rho, the volume charge density, multiplied by the velocity of the charge. Once again, we get coulombs per meter cubed and meters per, meters per second, giving us coulombs per second per meter squared, as anticipated. Now we are ready to discuss the continuity equation. So a moment ago we saw that the volume current density is equal to di dA perpendicular. We can rearrange this equation in the following way, saying that the infinitesimal current element is equal to the volume current density multiplied by the infinitesimal area element perpendicular to the flow. Of course then we can integrate this to get the total current, and the total current is going to be the integral of GD, G, dA perpendicular. And the usual trick here is to involve the dot product because that picked out, picks out the perpendicular element. So we get the current is the surface, uh, the surface integral of j dot dA. Now I'd like to remind you of the divergence theorem which I've written in purple here. So basically in the divergence theorem we go from a closed surface integral to a volume integral. So what I'm going to do here is note that at the moment we don't have a closed surface integral for j dot dA. So in fact I'm going to take a closed surface integral and then invoke the divergence theorem to be integrating over the volume. So we're going to have the closed surface integral of j dot dA is transformed to, or is equivalent to really, I suppose, the volume integral of the divergence of j. Now, I hope you realize that what we're actually looking at here in terms of this surface integral is the flux. It's the flux of the volume current density. Now, the placeholder we give for that is capital Phi. But if we're, what we're really talking about is the flow of charge. So the volume current density comes from the volume charge density. Of course, if there is charge flowing out, if there's current flowing out of your body, uh, it must happen, or it must be due to a flow of charge through the surface of your body, and it must come from the inside. So if there's charge or current leaving your body, it is coming at the cost of charge or current inside the body. So that means we can look at the flux, which is the, the closed surface integral of, we'll say, a dot dA, that, that really should be j, excuse me, j dot dA, is going to be minus the volume integral of the rate of change with respect to time of the volume charge density integrated d tau. We could equate this with the form that we have over here in terms of the volume integral. Now a quick inspection will convince you that the integrands are equal. And if the integrands are to be equal, that means that the divergence of j is equal to minus del rho del t. So that means that the divergence of the volume current density is minus the time rate of change of the volume charge density. We call this equation the continuity equation. Now although we haven't, I haven't really said that I have used nor invoked Maxwell's equations, you will see in later videos when I discuss Maxwell's equations that this in actual fact falls straight out. And you may already know that we're, in, we're invoking Maxwell's equations even though I haven't directly said so. So the continuity equation is really just an equation for the conservation of charge. So it's, it should make perfect sense to you that we have the conservation of charge. It's one of the fundamental laws. So let's just move on and have a, I have a few comments first of all. I'd like to define what a steady current is. A steady current is one that is never ending, or it's a never ending flow of charge. And what this means is that there is no accumulation of charge. You never have an accumulation of charge, otherwise you wouldn't have steady charges. Now if, excuse me, steady currents, 
if you have steady currents, we talk about magnetostatics. You might ask yourself, why is that? Well, you think about it, currents are the sources of the magnetic force. So steady currents will give us the static magnetic forces. So we talk about magnetostatic. Steady currents, magnetostatics. And they're at the, really the, the limit that we can't reach, of course, of never-ending flow and no accumulations of charge. However, in many real situations, we can approximate what's happening with this, a steady current and therefore invoke the results of magnetostatics. Now, it's interesting to note that point charges do not constitute a steady current because if they're here one second, they're gone the next, and that can't possibly be a steady current. There's one exception to this. It's when you're thinking of a, let's say, in very much classical uh, classical physics, let's think of a single electron orbiting an atom. Now, the speed at which the electron orbits the atom can often be on the order of 10 to the 6 meters per second, which, of course, is a, a massive speed. And as a result, it is equivalent or is close to a steady current. So although point charges and steady currents, electrons orbiting an atom at that particular speed, uh, they can often be approximated as being a steady current. Now, why have I spent so much time discussing steady currents? Well, I'm about to tell you. Just to say once more, a steady current is something which is constant in magnitude and has no buildup of charge. By definition, if there is no buildup of, char build of charge, that means delta rho, or the change in the charge, is zero. If the change in the charge is zero, that means the time rate of change in the charge is going to be zero. And what this implies is that the continuity equation is itself zero. Now remember what we're talking about in this particular case, we're talking about magnetostatics. So magnetostatics, in magnetostatics we get that the continuity equation is equal to zero. And of course this does, does not hold for magnetodynamics or for electrodynamics. And this shouldn't surprise you because, for example, we saw with electrostatics that the curl of the electrostatic field was equal to zero, or is equal to zero, excuse me, but the curl of the electrodynamic field is non-zero. So there are certain situations where you have uh, a change in the equations or the, the simplification of the equations when you go from the dynamic to the static case. So that's all I've got to say about that. Thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends, subscribe to my channel, and you might also give me a comment in the comment box below.